this is very intimate class, so what's your name? Because I know, th I know the others. Yeah. Miriam, okay. Um, and I saw you before, right? Yeah. yeah. What's your name again? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Simon Belmar. Um, I graduated from here. I did undergrad and master in Canada, and I came for a PhD here. Graduated six years ago. I've been a consultant since then, um, doing uh, design, repairs, and failure analysis. Um, I, I gave the model on life assessment in the spring. Uh, that's available online. It's a 12-hour uh, on how to determine the strength uh, of materials, how to deal with you know, creep, fatigue, everything that can happen in, in service. Um, this model that I'm starting today um, is a little bit more general because we're going to talk about safety factors. So how we're going to try to focus more on the demand size. And you know, I brought this here. It has this hoop stress crack because it froze. Uh, so that's abuse. And one of the basic question when you have a failure like this is, should you design so that the whole thing can freeze and not break? Um, and you know the answer. I don't think there's a there's a clear answer because this system was made such that the valve is inside the house. So this this whole tube is empty in the winter time when it's closed. But if you hook up something and you leave the valve open, then you have water all the way through, and you can have the overpressure um, to a point that. If we talked, uh, Professor Eager talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, pressure vessel code and uh, said, you know, you have a safety factor of four. Well, in this case, the safety factor for the thickness of that copper was more than four. Uh, this can resist, I have to check, but I, I think for, it's more than 400. Is it 400 or 600? PSI, yeah. yeah. And then you're gonna have maybe 60 to 80 PSI of water pressure uh, from the house. So you have a safety factor of say eight, six to 10. Um, but that wasn't enough. <laughs> so you know, how, how bigger are you really gonna make it? And when you talk to a plumber and you say you have a risk for freezing, they say, well, we're we gonna use plastic pipes. Uh, now with plastic pipes, something to keep in mind uh, when when people design these these pipes and certify them is there's no freezing test so uh, people rely on them to some extent thinking they can take some f freezing and unfreezing cycles but it's not it's not part of the testing requirements so you can go very fancy and say oh I want this pipe to resist exactly this many psi but in reality, you need it to be able to grow 3% in volume for each freezing and unfreezing cycle. So it's best if it's compliant uh, as opposed to, to really stiff. But it's very hard to optimize that if you're not really taking into account on the first place. So um, I sort of jumped in right in, but it's the concept of safety factor, I hope you'll get from the from this first, this is this is a series. We we're gonna start today going over definitions and talk about how we deal with practical design. And I'll take a few examples for that. Um, next class, we're gonna go more specific into how people look at safety factor from a statistics standpoint. Um, and uh, we also try to explain why the different industries are not that different, you know, the, bo the boiler and pressure vessel people are not that different from the automotive people and the aerospace people. They have to meet the expectation uh, for, for, for the parts for the product. So if it's supposed to last for 20 years, 20 flights a day, an aircraft, they're gonna try to reach that objective and with reliability, but as close as possible, because you don't want 
to you know double the weight of your design just because you don't want to the trouble go to the trouble of figuring out your 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 load expectation and your capacity uh, precisely. So overall, by experience, the different industry came up with this way of designing where most of the time there's no problem. And what you'll get from the class today, hopefully, is it's not four times stronger than it needs to be. And not at all. Um, and as we go further, I'm going to bring in more specific examples. We're going to start with examples uh, already today. Um, next class is going to be a little bit more on the theory side, and we're going to go back to examples in more depth uh, after that. So that's, that's the outline. That's, that's what I plan to do. Um, <coughs> the daily schedule is uh, for tomorrow I may be giving the second lecture or you may have Tom Eager we don't know yet but you'll have live lecture tomorrow Friday and uh, as well as Monday and Tuesday Monday and Tuesday I'll be lecturing so we we're going to be done with that that safety factor business by Tuesday probably um, and I'll also going to prepare a small set of lectures on uh, material selection. Uh, there is a module online um, uh, from Professor Eager that's very elaborate. I'm going to not supplement it, but make a subset of it that's not, it's not going to be the same. It would be kind of complementary. So if you're really interested in material selection, you can actually you know, do the live lecture and also do the, on the online modules uh, to your liking. Uh, for those that are, I've, I've put it up on the Stellar site. So the Stellar site, I'm going to post these notes that we have today. And uh, as far as what Professor Eager has been providing, we'll try to bring it back up. But it's not necessarily always uh, uh, as current. He's, he's working more with copies than, than I am. So my stuff is definitely going to be on the Stellar site. Uh, the announcement there that I put on is, you know there's a class in the fall and there's a class in the spring. And we're not repeating ourselves. We, we just keep going. Uh, not that there's some of the basic principles are not the same. But uh, in general, the, there's a different emphasis. Uh, so the emphasis for the last spring uh, was that life assessment and figuring out exactly the material strength and capacity. Um, that's available online, and Professor Eager did uh, forming in, in quite a bit of depth uh, last spring. Um, so as you know, this term, it's, it's on uh, measurements, codes and standard, safety factor, and material selection, uh, plus everything you want as far as the online models. Um, <coughs> if you have questions or feedback, I, uh, I, my MIT address is working. And on the Stellar, you have all the links. I also have uh, uh, another email address. I may as well write it down here. That I that is more, more easily accessible to me. Uh, so that's my family name. Uh, this is, if you have a very quick question, I'm here uh, most of the days on campus, but I always have different things going on so we can uh, figure out a time to meet. Um, if you want to do your projects on anything that uh, is related to uh, selection and that has some aspect of strength of materials, I can definitely help you. I've done a, a huge amount of that uh, over the past 10 years. Um, so, uh, f any questions so far? You, that's how I, I did want to start up uh, generally. So, uh, Professor Eager and I have been working together for 10 years on, on different consulting projects. And we are, in general, complementary. Uh, so, uh, hopefully you'll see that as well for the class that we're not really going to repeat ourselves. We're going to talk about the same thing, but sometimes with a slightly different uh, viewpoint. Um, 
the factor of safety, I did want to bring in the definitions uh, at the beginning so we're clear as to what people say it is. Um, so safety factor is what I tend to use, but uh, it, when I go to the books, they talk about the factor of safety, and there are two expressions for it. One is the failure load over the allowable load. And <laughs> you know, to be very clear here, uh, it'd be fair to say failure load, we can run a test for that. We can take um, an aircraft wing, um, a car, um, anything you want to build, a pipe, pressure, pressurize the pipe until it bursts, fine. This is the number. This is the, what it, can, it takes as far as failure load. Now, uh, are you always going to make the pipe the same way? Is it always going to have the same strength? That's really, really unclear. Uh, the more you introduce human factors like welding uh, or bolting, uh, the more you reduce your certainty as to what the failure load is. But that definition doesn't really tell you anything about if you're taking the minimum failure load or the maximum, it's the failure load, uh, no matter how you calculate it. The allowable load, uh, that's the example here. Uh, this ended up being subjected to a 4% volume variation. It didn't matter too much how strong the, uh, the, the, the copper was, the, the, the water wanted to grow, and this is what happened uh, to it. Um, it's not something that was included in the design. The design said, well, you got 80 PSI of, of, of pressure from the city. If maybe if somebody has his own uh, pump uh, because they have their own well, maybe they'll pressurize it up to 100 PSI, something like that. But uh, it's about as far as it's going to get if you don't have freezing. Um, and it, so you can design for that, say, 50 years. Uh, it kind of, kind of works out. But maybe you have bends uh, with piping system. If you put for 100 feet of that copper um, in a basement or an attic, um, and you still protect it from freezing, but it has temperature variation, the whole pipe may want to grow by an inch, two inches, from one season to the other. And if you restrain it on each side, say it's going to a concrete wall, or it has an elbow with a very tight clamp, uh, you can have a problem. You can create bending loads um, at the ends or wherever you have a T connection because you didn't think about the whole pipe trying to grow back and forth. Uh, in a large condominium complex, it happens, but it's more in the vertical direction. So people have risers that go all the way from the basement to the attic. And if you clamp the pipe too hard, top and bottom, y you can end up with uncontrolled um, displacement of the riser. Typically, the riser itself, so we're looking in a building, and I'll, I'll draw this because it's very relevant as far as loading and safety factor. Uh, so, if I have a riser pipe, and say I'm going to hook it up here at the bottom, it goes to a c the concrete floor, whatever it is. And on top, all of this, I have these, these clamps that's j just holding it laterally, and it bends over and distributes. Now, say over here, and this, we're going to make this a uh, 10-story building. I, I'm making it up, but it's, so it's 100 feet. If I have a little pipe here that comes to any utility, at this location, the T will want to move up and down, say, I'm going to put it half an inch because I want to be very conservative. It's in the building. So say you turn the heat off 
to s 50 or, or, or degrees of indoor temperature in the winter time because nobody lives there. Um, half an inch. This is my pipe right here. So this not so good. So I um, if if I'm holding this here because that's the utility, and then I'm moving half an inch here, there'll be a big problem because it's stiff. It, it is a metal connection, so I have to bend permanently make plastic deformation back and forth. And it's not something that's included in any of these allowable loads. Um, now, there are two issues with that is, do, do you need to make the material more compliant so it can take these variations? Or you have to make sure nobody does something like this? I mean, it, that, that really becomes an unknown issue for each industry. But just to, just to bring into perspective that allowable loan, in general, is not going to include things like this that will happen. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. The code actually says you have to account for thermal expansion when you lay out your system. Uh, but the, the situation do happen. Uh, so I think already we can get the idea that because we don't take into account things like this, we don't take into account um, freezing, we don't take, there's so many things we don't take into account in design that we do need a safety factor. Uh, now, some people will call it the factor of ignorance, and I want to be uh, cautious with that. Uh, obviously, as you know more, as you take the details of those two parameters, as you know more about your failure load, and you know more about your allowable load, yeah you can reduce the multiplication factor that you put onto it. It's true. Uh, at the same time, when we have a code like boiler and pressure vessel code, the safety factor of four, that's not the level of ignorance. Um, a good part of it is there for water hammers. Uh, water hammers is, is a, condi a condition you can have with steam pipes uh, when you get too much condensate into them, and then you, you start building up enough clotting in the pipe that eventually the water will uh, travel as slugs. And you, you can multiply the local pressure in the pipe by a factor of two or three easily. It's not that hard. And it can happen, and you don't want the piping system to fall apart because of that. Um, but it's not included in the calculated load. If, if, the, if the code tells you you're designed for 200 PSI of gas pressure, you can put 200 PSI in it. But then the water hammer comes in and you, you're up maybe to 600. And you still want the pipe to work. You can't, you can't tolerate you know, a, a sudden fracture just because you had a little water hammer. You, you can't all control these conditions. Um, and then, you know, part of what is left is, is not so much material property, but joining. Um, the welded connections in general are not as strong as the pipes. Um, there are some reduction, reduction factors. You're supposed to put doubler plate, like, like Professor Eager mentioned yesterday. Um, but even if you put doubler plate, you have to weld that doubler plate into the main pipe. And at that corner, you are reducing the strain lo locally. It's not as just having a plain uh, a, a broad pipe. Um, and that's, a, that's something that came out in, in the spring. And I think you asked me this. You wanted to build a pressure vessel out of spring steel. Yeah, OK. Uh, so and I think they, the, the first part of the idea is very clever. 
so let's say we take a cylinder like this. Uh, let's bring it complete back. So we have this cylinder, and we want to put pressure into it. And say we want to get as much pressure as we can for the weight of that vessel. That's a great idea. You can go to very high yield strength steel and have a tin wall. But then the question is, what are you going to do with these ends? Because you need to cap this. Or you, maybe you even have a seam here, depending on, on your design. You have to put a lap. It's maybe made out of a sheet that you fold over, and then you, you have a longitudinal joint. Uh, that is where your straight will go down. There's no, no matter what you do, if you bolt it, you know, you, you, you glue it, so it's, you have welding and bolts. That's pretty much what it boils down to. And it will reduce the strain in both directions. Obviously, your stress is going to be higher in the circu along the circumference than longitudinally. So in principle, this joint is not as big of a trouble if you reduce the strength by a factor of two, then you become balanced. Uh, but there is a, a transverse effect. So if I put this weld here, it will reduce the strength of the metal in the direction of the bead of the weld. And that's, and that's where the, the, the strength reduction comes in. And the boiler and pressure vessel code will not tell you, well, use a thicker piece of steel here if you have a, a welder joint. I mean, you have welder joints in general. So it needs to have this built-in reduction factor that is not so much of a, it's, it's not so much of an excess amount of metal. It's just taking into account typical practice. Um, you could change the boiler and pressure vessel code to a smaller value if you were to come up with a way where you wouldn't need these welds um, to put pipe sections of pipe together. Um, and you know, on the treaded pipe system, that's something that you get rid of. If, if you have a treaded joint um, at this location, I don't think you can do that on a big vessel. But for a pipe, then you, you can still design to the maximum pressure of that pipe if you can make your treaded connection resist the same force. So that's, that's still not uh, given. Um, so we're back here with respect to the different industries. And I, I'm sure Professor Eager started to introduce to you some of these values. So if you have a Livy, the New Orleans Livy that came down with Katrina, um, it was designed with a safety factor of 1.3 because there's only so much dirt you can put. And the force exerted by the, the water growing on top is very well known. It's, it's just gravity times the height. Um, the, the less understood aspect of this uh, was the soy, soy properties over time. So people. Um, made some assumptions a long time ago as to how much shear the, the soy was going to be able to take. But who knows uh, in terms of you know, a full s set assembly, it's very hard to do that test. So there's a lot of uncertainty as to what exactly a full sized um, structure Livy would be able to resist in terms of shear. And um, my understanding, I was not really involved in this, but my understanding is that's where the mistake was, that they, they assumed that the soil was going to be able to resist more than it actually was when it came all wet. Um, so was the safety factor 1.3 good enough? Well, it, it would be good enough if you had the right material properties. Um, so. It's, it's always tied together. How precise can you evaluate your material properties? And how conservative are you in your material properties? Uh, and that is influencing the safety factor. So you can keep the 1.3 safety factor if you say, well, I'm really going to you know, do more testing. 
I'm going to take the more sample of that soy, get it wet, and do the shear test. And I'll put those properties back into my design as opposed to making more of an estimate based on you know, one sample of data or you know, no testing at all sometimes. So it, it really varies. I've, I've been exposed to soy sampling mostly for corrosion resistance. And it varies a lot. Um, you can have multiple samples on one site. You have one area that's wet, the other area that's dry, and the resistivity of the soil is going to be different. Uh, so there's always uh, some uncertainty there, and you have to build that into account when you do your corrosion design. Um, aircraft structures. Um, so I've put a I put a 1.5 safety factor on it because that's the number that kept coming back. I worked in the, uh, the airframe business for a little bit. And um, the, there's a range. So the landing gear is designed with a safety factor of about 1.2. And, and, and th there are reasons for that. Um, the main reason is it's heavy. Um, and it's critical. So, and b if you take about those two aspects, it means the people, and you can determine the load. There's only so, so fast you can you know, run into the ground. Um, and you can only break so fast. Uh, so if you think about the load being very well predetermined, there's no welding. Uh, so th the material strength is well known. And then you do very detailed stress analysis of the whole assembly. So with these three, and you have very high quality control going all over the place with this design. Um, so when you, th when you think about all of this, everything is known and estimated in a conservative way. So you just put a 20% on it and everything is good to go. I mean, I've, landing gears are very reliable. Uh, more than some other things that may be designed with safety factor of three or four. Because that safety factor sometimes means nothing. Uh, when you don't take into account the joining, the excess loads, everything that is, is sort of assumed uh, possible to happen, but not necessarily in combination. There's a lot of that. Uh, that I if you make one mistake on a design or uh, manufacturing, you can be okay. But if you start, so you, you consume your 20% or 50% or whatever your margin is, but when you start combining these mistakes, that's really where the problem is. Um, so you, you really want to avoid that. So the piping in general for building, that's what we were talking about here. That's uh, not so much this example, because this is a pipe, so it's got a bigger safety factor. Um, but 1.5 to 2 is, is typical for a building. Uh, it's not always the same. You're going to go to 1.5 if you start taking into account snow load, wind load, and you, you, you become a little bit more precise as to what the load is. Um, if you're very general, then you may be at a fa safety factor of two. Pressure vessel we talked about quite a bit, that it's not really a safety factor of four. Uh, so if you want a very safe design, obviously you make it super heavy and you make it cost a lot. Um, in automotive, the rough figure, and that's a number from Professor Eager, I think it is material selection module. Um, the cost of adding a pound to, of weight to an automotive is about $2 for the life cycle. And that's, I mean, fuel, more brakes repair, you know, bigger wheels, tires, kind of all factored in, it comes to about $2. So, it's more than the price of the steel to begin with. So if you, you may be willing to put a little bit more money 
on the initial material if you can reduce the weight. And that's the whole you know, concept of material selection. But there is a limit to it. And there is also a, a question of how, what's your acceptable failure rate? You know, if, if, if a car is designed with four seats and somebody decides to load it with lead shots on the back seat, go for a ride and bust the, the rear suspension. It's, it's designed to uh, essentially, if you, if you break the coils or if you compress the coils too much, uh, normally there's a seat on which it'll stop. So you're not losing a wheel, you are losing your suspension and you, you're out of alignment, your, your camber is changing, but there's, a fail, there's some form of fail-safe factor in there. And it's the same with a tire. I mean, we make these tires uh, able to resist pressures much higher than what you put in them for service, but it does happen then that, that a tire blow off, but it doesn't mean an accident is gonna happen for sure. Yeah, you can be unlucky if you're turning and, the, and, and that's when the tire comes off. So, and it's all things that we are willing to live with because we know <laughs> it's there. You know, you're not supposed to take a curve at the maximum speed you can take with your wheels on because if you lose a wheel, if you lose a tire, you're losing control. Um, and I'm not, I'm not here to tell you, you know, don't do this uh, or not in an individual level, but from an engineering standpoint, there's a limit. You can't design for all abuse. I can take a car and break it if I want to. I'm probably going to be hurt. And that's, that's how the, the car industry, and I work quite a bit with ATVs, the, the four-wheelers, it's a little bit how they think of this. They, they think of it, I'm gonna make it strong enough, but if you run into a tree, it's actually better if the whole thing deforms on you and breaks as opposed to staying rigid. Well, it can't really stay rigid. It would be too heavy. Nobody would want that car or ATV or motorcycle, whatever it is, on, 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 and drive with it. It'd be, completely um, uncomfortable, you get stuck everywhere. You don't, you don't want extra weight that you don't need. But that's where, that's where the line is as far as reliability. There's always going to be a limit when you get into misuse and abuse. And again, for, for cars, I think a good over general criteria is what you call a crash if you get into a crash, it's perfectly fine to wreck the car. It's more if you are, you know, still in control, then you don't want to lose a wheel or, or break a, a piece of suspension. Um, unless you, you, know, you have way too much, too much weight on it. Um, so we are not making structures that much stronger than they need to be. When we say factor safety of two, three, four, you can make it 10, but if you calculate, you calculate it differently, it may be, end up being the same design. Uh, so there's the difference. So what we're getting to at this point is the factor of safety is tied to how exactly you do the design. If I'm doing the design in a very detailed way, then I use a lower safety factor, essentially. That's, that's really true. So the factor of ignorance is true, although, again, we know what we're not accounting for. It's not that much of an ignorance. Um, so if we do design, we have the demand. Um, in this case, that's the freezing water, the pressure in the freezing water and a capacity. So when we do tests on the copper, we get you know, yield strain, ultimate strain, elongation, all sorts of things. Um, and there's variation each way. Um, 
I'm going to talk about this um, example. It's somebody that um, came to me about five years ago. He had this fancy boat. Um, uh, it was pretty much not a competition, but it was a speed boat. And the, uh, going from the back, you had the water, say this is the water level, and the, um, the shaft was right about water level, and you had these props. Um, so when this is all spinning, you have half of the shaft that's in the water and half that's not in the water. So you have a lot of bending loads in the shaft. And that's what we saw at the very end, um, that it was a bending failure with the, um, the crack initiating in this corner and going all the way to this, this line here right in the middle. Um, so if it was a torsion or anything else, the line wouldn't go from one side straight to the other, all the way to half the depth. So it starts here, and you have these, these beach marks uh, all the way to here, and then there's a final fracture. Uh, the conclusion here, well, one of the conclusions is the load was not that high because you could crack half the way through the thickness and you're still whole. You're still running. Um, but, you know, it did exceed the material capacity because you failed gradually by fatigue. So if you design a shaft, talking about a safety factor of three, but you use the yield strength as opposed to the fatigue strength, that's a big difference. You would say we well, take a factor of two outs. Now you, already, you only have 1.5 safety factor. And we haven't taken everything else into account. There was rubbing here. So there, there's a contact between the hull and the shaft that created a notch there that, again, increases the load and reduces the capacity. And you have a failure now. I do want to say in this context here with the factor of safety that uh, by design they only plan for the shaft to last 400 hours of, of service. Um, it was a you know very it was an, a nickel base uh, alloy an inconel alloy and that's how they decided that that's all you get out of it. Um, now. <laughs> You know, they could tell the owner more precisely because he didn't know uh, when he lost the prop and was stuck kind of on the ocean. But uh, he only had, you know, one of these. Uh, but it, it's, it was considered acceptable because it's a sport unit and because, you know, losing a prop, yeah, you, you, know, you lose some money, whatever the metal is. Uh, goes down to the, the ocean and you have to get a towboat. But if you were to s make it so it doesn't fatigue, maybe you need a couple inch more. I mean, this was already five inch or six inch in diameter. It was very, very heavy. Um, you could, if you had space, you could make it bigger and hollow. That would be good for bending. I mean, there are ways to, to go around this. But depending on, so the safety factor for this is less than one, right? Because it, it does fail during, or it's exactly one, depending on how, if you say it's good for 400 hours, apparently it lasted 500. So there was nothing to complain about. Um, but the, the, the bottom line is it, your acceptance criteria makes a big difference on, on how you're going to calculate the safety factor. In this case, if I say, well, I don't want people to lose it in less than 400 hours, so I'm going to design it for, for 550 hours. And I know it's going to be rough. It's going to get beaten up by the hole. So uh, there's going to be a crack to begin with. 
day one. So I'm just looking at the time that the crack actually grows from this location to this location. Hey, that actually is pretty easy to reproduce. Uh, if you have a given size boat with given torque, um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's to the limit optimization, but it's reproducible. The, the crack propagation properties, if you, if you have a constant load uh, given by the torque that this can apply, you're good to go. Um, and, that's, and that's what they did. But it, I thought it was an interesting concept because it shows you, you still have a safety factor of three when it leaves the factory because it doesn't have a crack in it. If you try to break it, good luck. It's going to bend. Um, then you go through service and after even just the first year, you already have a crack in it, maybe half an inch, quarter inch. And you could detect that if you wanted to. If, if, if a crack was not acceptable to you, you could go and look for cracks at the critical loading, the highest load location. Um, but, you know, in general, I would say you would like to think, especially for something like this, that you, you take it out on, on, on the ocean and your service per person at the end of the season should be able to tell you, oh, you know, this has been running so many hours, we got to change this, we got to change that. And that's, that's, that's a little bit how the maintenance comes in. And that's the concept that's around in aviation, the small aircrafts, every so many hours, you take it out and you change this, you change this, you change this. <coughs> Even for a turbine engine, uh, you have to change the blades uh, after a certain amount of service life. It may depend on you know, how many takeoffs, what was the duration. They have these equations that says, well, you, you passed the life. Just, it's a teardown. You change the blades. Um, and it's to make sure that it doesn't fall below a certain criteria. And for those blades, I would say also, you know, at the beginning, you do have a safety factor. It's going down. It's not good forever. Uh, so it just makes, I guess, you more aware of what a, a safety factor is. Um, it's tied to the design. Um, we talked enough about this one. Let's talk about this. Um, this is a fuel cap for uh, um, uh, water ski, uh, 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 water boat, jet ski. So you, you put the, um, you put this from the outside on the hull, and then you screw it on the inside on this one, and then you have this hose adapter. You can put it on the hose, and um, just put a clamp on it. Now, it's a molded nylon material. Um, very easy to make. It's uh, weather resistant. It's lightweight. So you put the clamp here. Now, one of the design considerations for this, in principle, is almost no load. I mean, you take the cap off here, put the fuel in, close the cap. There may be a little bit of torque here. But this tubing is essentially connecting the hull to the engine, com the, the, the engine block and everything that comes with it in the bottom of the jet ski. And there will be some distance variation between the two. So because this is a big hose, so if I, it's becoming similar to this, but from loading perspective. So, uh, If I have the cap here, this is the connection, and I have the hose going to the engine, and I put a clamp here. So this is the whole block. It's much bigger than this, but um, I say I have the hole is connected to the, the bottom. The plat there's a platform here where you put the engine on. 
So this piece is not always going to follow this one. There's going to be some deflection of, of the cover, some deflection of the bottom. So there'll be some height variation. And when you design this plastic component, there's no pressure really that comes into it. Um, after you put the tread, say I put the tread here, so it's clamping at this location. So this area, you have the hole, you're clamping, you, you, here you only have some plastic. The load that this will see is the mismatch displacement between the, the hull and the platform where the, where the engine is mounted on. How do you know exactly that load? I think you don't. So you have two options. You make this hose very flexible. And if you do that, you may even have to clamp it so it doesn't sort of bounce around and gets into uh, a vibration mode. Or you do some testing. If you do testing, well, you may have to put some load sensor here. Um, you can't really design this uh, you know, using fine element, for example, because it's just not going to take into account everything. You can have the guy comes and try to pull the hose. If the hose is a little shorter, he's going to pull the hose and, and to try to make the connection. So a lot of times, this connection will just, will mostly come from experience. They have a prototype that works. Um, they make it a little stronger maybe, and they go for a service. And as long as they don't have a problem, they, they, they continue on with, with the design. If somebody decides, oh, we'd like to save some money here, it becomes difficult because you don't know what your factor of safety is. Um, that's, that, that assembly situation, I think, with you know, the two pieces moving, it's really a situation where it's mostly experience that's going to tell you whether the pl this plastic piece is, is strong enough. Um, so it's not to discourage us from you know, doing statistics and, and, and talking about all these other things. Um, it still requires you to be consistent in how to make this. If you change your specification, if you allow for the use of another material, you can easily get in trouble because you may be very close to a failure situation. You just haven't been exposed to it. Uh, so that's the issue, uh, I would say, when you, you're not understanding completely your assembly. Um, the good thing about this example, though, is it doesn't matter too much who's driving the unit. Um, there'll be some variation um, but in, in, in terms of the magnitude of the displacement, but I think this is more of an internal load issue with the jet ski as opposed to the jet ski and how the people are driving it um, and, and how severe or aggressive the driving is. Um, so we have not gone through all I wanted to go through but we'll continue tomorrow. Uh, and in the meantime, do you guys have questions? Anything we could talk about? Because that's always very nice. I like that. Typically, it takes a couple lectures before you guys break in and start. Yes, I know you have a question. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. But now the GUI I see it's not going to be next class. It's probably going to be the following class. Um, the, the, I mean, the basic, the bottom line is you can only use it within a very limited framework. Uh, and Professor Eager, I know last class mentioned about service history. It is your best source of data. A lot of times, if you've been doing this in a certain way and nobody complain about it, then you can do statistics to figure out why. But you can't go st and do statistics on something that you haven't built yet. There's, there's no data. 
you can tr pretend like you're doing statistics if you're using data from other systems that are similar. But it's not real. It's, it's, it's just, uh, so a lot of times, um, that's, that's, that's the general philosophy. You, you can have these error bands, like in aerospace, we'll say we'll have a 95% confidence interval, and that's what we use for material properties. And over time, we realize, oh, it works. But you, you can't start from the ground up with those statistics normally. It's a sad story. I mean, people write a book on them, but in the end, you can't do everything just based on that. It's a good question. Anything else? All right, think about it. Tomorrow or Monday. So there's live lecture tomorrow. Thank you.